Hello everybody and welcome to this new series which is a bit different from my other content so far as it's not really a playthrough but given the, well I should say celebrating the new 2.0 version of Imperator Rome I thought it would be a good idea to do a faction guide for some of the factions. Now, this faction guide will not be game mechanics based. I'm doing this faction guide more for the player who is interested in the history of who they're playing and really wants to role play. Now, our first faction guide is going to be on Macedon. Now let's get this out of the way right off the bat. I know it's Macedon. Macedon is easier to say and I would like to say Macedon but to be honest if I commit to that I'll probably go in and out between the two pronunciations. So it is better just to say Macedon. Let's begin with culture. Believe it or not, the culture of the ancient Macedonians is still very much a contemporary issue, especially in this region of the Balkans. I'm not a politics channel, I'm not going to weigh in on that too much, but I can't ignore it. Modern day Macedonians, who are more located here in the north, this would be considered Upper Macedon, they are claiming the history of the ancient state of Macedon and the Greeks, they counter this by saying no, Alexander the Great was a Greek style king. So obviously any argument is going to be loaded and I'm going to try and unload the gun here just by talking about how these people considered and related towards each other in um, Alexander's day. So let's talk about geography because if you're going to talk about the culture of a people, geography should be one of the first things you talk about. Geography shapes a surprising amount. It can shape not only the way of life of the people, but their religious outlook, you know. If I wanted to make an example, let's look over here in uh, Mesopotamia, right? These rivers do not flow in a very ordered way. They flow very suddenly and erratically. The gods must have seemed very pernicious and cruel. Yet in Egypt, the Nile floods fairly regularly every September. Even now, I think it's September, maybe, uh, it may be June or July, but the point is, it's a very predictable flood, very slow and gradual, so the afterlife seemed like an amazing place. But not to get sidetracked from Macedon, I'm just trying to illustrate how important geography can be to a people, as it is with uh, those of Macedon and Greece. Let's look at the geography of Greece. It's very mountainous very rocky, lots of rocky outcrop little peninsulas here, volcanic islands. This is Greece. Now let us look at Macedon. Well Macedon has a bit of both. It has a bit of a rocky coastline, but if you go inland you see a lot of this um, forest land here and it really covers most of northern Macedonia even into some of the coastal re regions if you see this area here called the Chalcidides there's a lot of lumber and it doesn't look like on the map it looks like a few trees but you must remember a lot of these maps are representative of um, a great deal more we can see already that the geography in these two lands was vastly different. It made the Macedonians take up a more pastoral lifestyle in the country. You know, these settlements here tend to hug the coast and inland you have, uh, you know, the hill regions and the forest regions. So you had these two very diametrically opposed environments that bred 
very diametrically opposed people. Country Macedonians were rough. They were what we would consider country people, rough country living. And the coastal livers were what you would call the city boys, you know? Um, now in Greece, Greece, you didn't have that upland country. You have it here and there, but by and large, it's all coastal cities because there's not much arable land because of the mountains and the volcanic islands. And that's why Greece developed these city-states probably quicker than Macedon. And this is how they came to define themselves. They defined themselves by the polis, which is Greek for city. But here's the thing. It doesn't mean city, not in the way we think of city. It meant the city and everything that goes on in the city, the institutions, namely the political institutions. Now, let's look at their political systems, shall we? The Greeks were oligarchic or democratic. They had a good mix, especially around the time of the game. They were kind of split down the middle. Now, you might think there's no difference between an oligarchy, say, and a monarchy, which is what uh, Macedon had. But there's a big difference. There's more representation in an oligarchy. It's very limited representation, but it's significantly more. Um, frequently in Greek history, the government of an oligarchy will overthrow its leader and proclaim a tyrant. This happens again and again. It even happens in democracies. For example, the tyrant Pasistratus took control of Athens. And even before that, there was a tyrant called Clasthenes and Sicyon who became a tyrant, and Sicyon was a oligarchy. So in Greece, you tended to have more active representation. And this is how the Greeks defined themselves, by this practice of essentially living free of monarchy, being able to choose more of their destiny. Now, for modern standards, this may seem quite funny and quaint because we know that women did not have suffrage, women couldn't vote or anything, and they had very little rights and they were slaves. But for the time, that this wasn't going on anywhere else in the world. Macedon had a different situation altogether. There was a royal family who considered themselves um, Hellenic, Greek. And the Greeks considered their royal family the Agriad dynasty Greek. They did not consider the Macedonians Greek. Why? Because the Macedonians lived under a king, the Agriad king. And already we see the split where the Agriad king tended to rule in the cities in the urban areas, which tended to be around Pella. So the Macedonian king tended to rule this, like a small area, like not the Chalcidides, that was an important Greek independent colony, but kind of here and um, just around Pydna. But in the countryside, even though the upper Macedonians swore loyalty to the Agriad royal family. This was a very kind of uh, frivolous oath. The Macedonian king frequently had to travel up north here and press that authority. It wasn't just given. Even within the king's own um, nobles, his own local nobles, who would rule estates in this urban land, his authority would be very, very um, tenuous. And thus, the Macedonian kingship was not a very strong kingship. It was always being challenged. They tend not to last very long, and they tend more often than not to have violent ends. To be a successful Macedonian king, you had to really 
be a strong character. In fact, that's how they define their king, not of the land that they ruled, but by the authority that they just naturally had. It wasn't due to descent, like most other kingships. It was due down to the sole character of the person. So, the cultural differences between Greeks and Macedonians are simple. At the Greek symposium, you would go to the host and you would sit on one of those um, fancy sofas and you would talk about the plays of Aeschylus and the latest speech by Demosthenes and it would all be a very refined time. You would drink cut wine because that was the proper way to drink wine cut with water, us it's too strong, and you would enjoy the benefits of your civilization. They were very self-impressed with the level of their civilization and the fact that they had uh, lived in this grand system of the polis. Now, 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 in Macedon. If you went to a Macedonian symposium, because the Macedonians did have symposiums, because um, the urban Macedonians, they embraced Greek culture, at least the trappings of Greek culture, but it was a little different. If you went to one of their symposiums, it would be more like... You know, you, they drank uncut wine, which was crazy to the Greeks. All sorts of debauched things happened at the Macedonian Symposium. And this brings us to our final point of the culture between these two people. There is a reason why a Macedonian conquered most of the known world. There's a reason that a Macedonian did that and not a Greek. And the reason is, the Macedonians were kind of freaking crazy. Okay, so we've talked about cultural differences, let's talk about history of it. And I'm not gonna go into the genesis of the Macedonian state. I'm gonna back up a bit into about 50 years before the start date of the game. And I'm gonna talk a little about the contemporary times in which the game is set, you know, the game start date, but not too much because that's where you take over and role play. There's probably one name you should start with when you talk about the state of Macedon growing into a power. Can you guess? I'm willing to bet that 30% of you said Alexander the Great. And maybe 90% of you said Philip II, his father. Those numbers don't make sense. Anyway, whatever. I'm a history teacher, not a mathematician. I'm here to tell you there's one name that frequently gets forgotten in the conversation. Philip II's father, Amentus III. Now, he was still quite a powerless king, but he did some important things. Amentus III saw the situation going on in Greece. The situation was Athens, at the time, had this huge naval empire. They called it a league, but it was an empire. It, basically, if you, tra if you see the outline of my mouse, this was the empire. These Aegean islands and the Greek colonies on the coast of Asia Minor. Now, Athens was at war with Sparta, who basically had their own league or empire, and it was basically all of this peninsula here called the, the Peloponnesus and the city of Megara and Corinth. Now, Amentus III saw the situation going on, and at the time, this area here, the Chalcidides, was um, independent. And it's a very important uh, trading league at the time they had. He organized a deal with the Chalcidides and Athens to export Macedonian timber, of which they have a lot. 
Now this made Macedon very wealthy, you know. For the first time, I think the king had access to all this money resource. Now, when the war turned against Athens, Amentus made overtures to the Spartans, right? And essentially told the Spartans, you invade the Chalcidides and um, I will ship my lumber to you. And that way, Amentus ensured that there would be no middleman. So this started a monopoly in the lumber trade for Macedon. And it's so funny that um, Amentus was essentially playing the superpowers off each other here. This was like the Cold War. War. War never changes, if I can quote Fallout. And it never does. This kind of thing also happened in the 70s, in the Cold War, you know. These minor countries would pit the USA and Russia off against each other. And it's just a reminder that history is never really dead and what's been done has been done before. Oh, I love it. This brings us to Philip II, his son. Now, Philip II was not actually supposed to rule Macedon. He was the younger brother, but his older brother Perdiccas had died fighting against the Illyrians. He got killed in battle. It was like a big thing, and the Illyrians were um, threatening to invade. So Philip II became king. He didn't become king straight away. He was the regent for his um, nephew, but the Macedonian nobles felt that they needed a hand against these Illyrians, and a kid just wouldn't do it. See, this is the important thing about the Macedonians. Their kings have to be front and center. They have to be in the thick of the fighting. Well, Philip II was the man for the hour, because not only did he beat back the Illyrians, he concluded a very important treaty with them, and he did this by using marriage. Philip II was a great diplomat. He, I would say, for all of his military uh, genius moves, there are at least two moves of genius diplomacy. Now, he married an Illyrian princess, and that border was secured. What he did next was he campaigned in Upper Macedonia here. The people of Upper Macedonia were very loose with their oath to the king, so he campaigned tirelessly to bring them to order. And he totally reorganized the Macedonian army. Now, one of the things he did was he organized units along um, territorial lines so that units were kind of fighting together with their own people, which hadn't happened before. Before, the king of Macedon was kind of counting on his nobles to kind of just bring up men. And, you know, that there was a question of loyalty. He went into Thrace, this area here is known as Thrace, kind of modern day Bulgaria. And he didn't conquer the Thracians, but he again married a Thracian princess and really pacified this region because this region was inhabited by um, tribes of very skilled skirmishers. He concluded a treaty which brought Thracian manpower, these superb Thracian skirmishes, into his army. So even though he wasn't ruling this area, he technically had authority over it. He decided that for Macedon to be a power in its own right, it really had to find a way of controlling this area here, the Chalcidides. Now, why is the Chalcidides so important? The Chalcidides were very important because, one, they controlled the lumber trade, and two, they had gold mines. So they had access to fabulous wealth. He ended up going to the Athenians, and 
During the latter days of the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta, this city here, Amphipolis, was um, Athenian, but then it defected and became independent. And during the latter days, the Athenians had tried and failed to conquer it. In the treaty that concluded that war, they got Amphipolis back. Now, Philip struck up a deal with Athens, and Philip said to Athens, Well, I'll conquer Amphipolis, and if you give me Pydna, another important port city, which uh, wasn't in the Macedonian realm, I will lease back Amphipolis to you. The Athenians quite liked this arrangement, and they said yes. So, Philip ended up conquering Amphipolis, and he got Pydna. Hilariously enough, he didn't give up Amphipolis, and the Athenians couldn't really do anything about it. They just weren't in a position at that time. Very close to this time, a war was happening in this area here, Thessaly. Thessaly and Boeotia. And it centered around Delphi, the famous oracle at Delphi. Delphi was run by a league called the Amphimtionic League, which was basically a collection of cities that administered this very important religious city. Now, what happened was, one of the cities in this league, Phocis, which I don't believe is... It's not represented here for some reason. Phocis wanted to take control of Delphi. Now, since the Peloponnesian War, the city of Thebes, represented here, had become the hegemon of Greece. Because Athens and Sparta had fought themselves to a standstill, and Thebes kind of filled that power vacuum. Thebes decided to back um, the Amphimtionic League. Sensing blood, Sparta and Athens, you know, worst enemies, decided to back Phocis. So, now on one side you have Phocis, which is backed by Athens and Sparta, and you have the Amphimtionic League which is backed by Thebes, the hegemon of Greece. Phocis hires mercenaries, which it marches into Thessaly. The League of Thessaly, not being able to do anything, appeals to Philip II, you know, seeing his recent victories against the Illyrians and Thracians, and they ask Philip II to intervene, which he does. Now, at first, the Phocians beat off Philip, but eventually he wins. He wins an amazing battle at Crocus Fields. Now, this gave him unparalleled power in Northern Greece, because the Thessalian League, which is all of these cities here, voted Philip Targos. Now, Targos is a term that meant general. So, in effect, Philip added Thessaly and all of their resources to his kingdom. And Thessaly had some of the best cavalry in Greece, so this made him a very powerful man. This war, by the way, was called the Third Sacred War. And it was the war in which Philip ultimately turned himself into the arbiter of Greek affairs. Anyway, what comes out of the Third Sacred War is it convinces Athens that Philip is a huge problem, and they begin pulling together their own league, and this time they recruit Thebes, which is the current hegemon. Now, remember, Thebes was on the side of the Amphimtionic League, but Thessaly sidelined asking Thebes for help and went to Philip. So this rightly pissed off the Thebeans. War broke out between Thebes, Athens, and Sparta uh, against 
Macedon. And the whole thing came to a head at the Battle of Caronea, where Philip broke the pan-Greek army. And this made Philip and Macedon the unquestioned masters of Greece. By this time, Philip had incorporated the whole of the Chalcidides into his empire, which is really, at this point, it's an empire. And he is really profiting from not only the lumber trade, which he has a monopoly on, but the massive influx in gold, which he used in his army reforms. Around this time is the time in which he decides to invent the Sarissa. He begins to really drill his army into a machine, really, which, of course, Alexander the Great would greatly benefit from inheriting. Now, these were his military victories, but I told you about his diplomatic genius. What does Philip do when he wins this crushing victory against the Greeks? Well, he actually does something very intelligent. He doesn't garrison troops anywhere in Greece. He basically gives Greece back to Greece, which is a bit of an empty gesture because he's just crushed their armies. So um, it's not like Greece could rebuild or do anything, but he pulls the Greek city-states into a league called the Corinthian League, and it would be based in Corinth, the city of Corinth here. This is his genius. He pulls them against a common enemy, the king of Persia. He said he wants to invade Persia and make the great king of Persia pay for sacking um, Athens in the Persian Wars. So this immediately won him favor in Athens. There were some that saw it for what it was as just a political maneuver, but um, this overall was a very intelligent move. He takes a Greek uh, bride. Now you might be thinking, wow, that how many brides does he have? This was another big difference between the Greeks and the Macedonians. Macedonians believed in polygamy, many wives, and the Greeks, of course, did not. So where we are now, Philip has kind of sewed up this whole peninsula here under him. And instead of having to deal with any kind of internal threat, he has everyone focusing on eventual invasion of Asia. Now, you might say, didn't anyone see through this? Yeah, sure, plenty did. But at the same time, these cities here, these small Greek city-states here, saw Philip as a better alternative to Athens or Sparta. They had spent the last 50 years being dominated by either one or the other. So they saw Philip as a better alternative. Philip was offering autonomy to these smaller Greek city-states. They could trade with who they wanted, they could do what they wanted, within reason, I guess. In our next episode, we will look at how everything got so much bigger and grander for the Macedonians, how they conquered the whole known world, and eventually how everything fell apart. And this will bring us up to date with what's going on at the start of Imperator Rome. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see similar uh, faction historical guides, please like and subscribe as it's the only way I can tell. And I guess I'll see you next time. Ciao, Bella.